Well, good morning, church. Uh, great to be here with you guys once again this morning. Um, uh, truly honored and uh, blessed and grateful to be able to bring the word of God to you guys this morning. Um, you know, my prayer for us is that uh, this morning that we would just each receive a word from heaven that would just help change the, the direction and that, uh, of our future and our path. Um, and at the same time, be encouraged and, and and really wrestle with the word this morning. Um, I'm looking forward to bringing it to you. And so this morning, I want to just share with you guys uh, my story, um, my testimony, my, I guess, encounter I had with the living God. Um, you see, my story is a, a real testimony to, to the love and, and faithfulness of God and just how he used a real difficult time of my life where, you know, I guess I was full of um, unanswered questions um, where I was full of uh, confusion, um, thinking to myself, you know, what is the meaning of life? You know, what is the meaning of life? And um, I guess God really answered that for me, and, and it was out of that, God, uh, God has really just um, directed and, and straightened my path, you know, which has led me to be here this morning and to be here today. And, um, and I just love that we each have a story to tell, Amen. You know, we each have a testimony. You know, the Bible says in Revelation that it's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony that we overcome. In other words, our testimonies are, uh, they're a weapon against our adversary, you know, the devil. You know, it's also a weapon that, um, that uncovers, you know, the lie, the lies of this world. You know, the lie that the things of this world, world will, will satisfy you. You know, the lie that if you just had a, a little more money or if you had a, a better car, if you just lived here or instead of there, um, if that girl or guy liked me, you know, and just the lie that you can find satisfaction and happiness outside of Jesus Christ. And that's the biggest lie of them all. And so I can truly say because um, what I went through personally, um, I've now discovered a deep and, and lasting, you know, satisfaction that only Jesus can give to the heart. Um, and so before I get into that, I want to, if you have your Bibles, um, if you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to Luke 12, uh, 16 to 19. If, uh, feel free to follow but just behind me on the screens. And so here we're going to see this parable of this rich, rich young fool. And I just love when Jesus told these parables. Uh, and I know for us, we can kind of, you know, skim past these stories that Jesus told and we can kind of say to ourselves, you know, you know, this one's not for me or I, I can relate to this one more. Um, but for us this morning, church, I just believe that this parable is, is completely for us and so relevant for us right now. It might, and it might be actually the most impactful parable for living out a, a peaceful and um, joyful life. And so in Luke chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, and we're going to just start down in verse 16. And like many of the parables of Jesus, Jesus is uh, teaching a big crowd here in this context. Uh, and it says that multitudes of, of people were, were flocking to come and hear Jesus speak. You know, people were pretty much trampling on top of one another to, to hear the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. Because when you hear Jesus, you, know, you realize that he drew people to himself. You know, the things that he was saying were, were so impactful to life that they were that they gave you direction for your life. They, and so everywhere he went, you know, the crowds would follow him. And so Jesus is telling the story, and it goes like this. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Church, let me pray for us this morning. Well, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that... Um, you have so much to reveal to us. And Lord, I just speak peace over every heart and every person here in this place so that you would just fill our hearts, fill this room, um, fill our lives with hope, Lord God. 
Um, I pray that you would help me deliver this uh, word in a way that honors you, Jesus. Uh, we give you all the glory in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, last week, Pastor L preached an amazing message on um, what is that one thing? What is that one thing? And I want to kind of touch on that today and look at it from another angle. Um, because I know we can all relate to this in some way. Um, and so with that in mind, I, wanna, I just want to ask you this question. Um, I want to ask you this. Have you ever had a goal uh, or a dream or, or some uh, big event in your life where you thought, you know, if I could just accomplish this one thing, if this one thing would happen to me, I would just feel like my whole life was worth it. You know, have you ever had a goal or a dream that you just had in your mind somewhere out there where you just thought, like, I, if this just happened to me, like, it could be, you know, getting that degree or it could be buying that house or that dream car that you've always wanted or it could be winning the lotto. You know, I'm sure we've all had those thoughts in our heads somewhere, somewhere out there where you just thought, man, if this, is, if this just happened to me, you could re- live the rest, you know, of your life in happiness knowing that, you know, it was all worth it. Well, I want to tell you about my dream when I was a kid. And so growing up, um, I used to love playing footy. Um, I remember my dad uh, joined me up to my first uh, footy, footy team when I was seven years old. And so from a very young age, you know, I discovered that, man, I would love to do this for the rest of my life. And so as I, I got older in my teenage years, I discovered that I was actually good at uh, playing, playing footy. And... It, um, and so um, as I began to, to play, I, I discovered I was making these rep teams. I was getting um, invited to these camps um, to, to, to further my skills and, and to play. Um, but the moment got real for me when after a footy carnival, a, uh, a player agent came up to me and said, Smithy, I want to I manage you. I want to I wanna be your manager. And, and so he sat down with my parents and I. Um, and we signed a contract with him to be my manager. And so he was saying all these things that, oh, man, you know, I've got a few clubs that might be interested in you. And in my head, I was like, man, I would, I would love to play, play for the Broncos one day. That's, you know, that, you know, growing up as a kid, I was watching Wendell Saylor and Darren Lockyer and Anna Langer run around. Um, I used to have their posters on my wall. And so I would idolize these guys, right? And so not only did I want to uh, play for the Broncos, uh, um, there was one other thing that my mind shifted to as a kid. I wanted to play for Queensland in the state of origin. Any Queenslanders in here? We've got two. Any New South Wales supporters? Yeah, we're going to pray for you guys after this. So it's all good. Um, but no, I, I, I would, my dream was to play for Queensland in the state of origin. So... During my um, school teenage years, I would always play the scenario in my head that I would um, win the game, game three for Queensland. So when, when Origin came around, you know, everyone talks about it being the, the toughest game you've ever played, um, state against state, mate against mate. And I would play the scenario in my head that Smithy will get the ball. It's 12 all, game three, full house, packed out at Suncorp Stadium, 30 seconds to go, Smithy gets the ball. You know, kicks the field goal to win it for Queensland. The crowd goes up. And I would play the scenario in my head when Origin came around. I go, oh, if I just had, if this happened to me, I'm done. I'm done with life. That's, I'll, I'll be happy for the rest of my life. And that was my big event. You know, that was my big dream I had. But unfortunately, that never happened. <laughs> that big dream of mine never happened. I did end up playing in the NRL, but not for the Broncos. Um, but, um... That big dream never happened. You see, I've never had a moment, you know, a single moment that got me the kind of satisfaction that I hoped it would. You know, what's funny is that even if I did, it wouldn't have given me the kind of satisfaction that I hoped for from these big events. Because what I've learned in my life and what I've experienced is that these big events, you know, why they may seem magical when you're hoping for them, you know, they really ever have the power to... To, to transform your life in the way that you wanted, um, that you would imagine that they would. And so in this scripture, we got the story of this guy that thinks that this big event, it's reaching you know, a certain dollar amount, being able to have all the money he needs. 
you know, all the grain that he, that he needs. And I think in the back of our minds, especially in our, our Western culture, uh, we, can, we kind of sort of have this idea that our goal is to, you know, work as hard as we can, make enough money and have enough influence and power and money that someday, they, you know, we can just retire and do whatever we want to do. You know, I'm sure we've all had those uh, thoughts somewhere in our minds. You know, even if you don't realize it, that if you really break it down, church, the bottom line is that we want to be able to do whatever we want whenever we want and retire and live the kind of life, you know, we want to live. And so really the story is not a story about, you know, some rich guy with a, with a barn. You know, it's really a story about us. It's really a, a story about what happens when we try to, you know, build our lives toward us instead of toward God. And what Jesus is trying to teach us here is that, you know, the end comes, the end comes for everybody. And if you've built a life toward yourself, then all you've built is for nothing if it's not for Jesus. And he's trying to teach us that the plans that we have in our heart, while they may seem right in our hearts, you know, they're rarely ever for um, kingdom purposes. That's why when you read Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose prevails. It's not our heart's purpose that prevails. It's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And that's why it's kind of scary to, you know, follow your heart these days. You know, we hear that mantra, you know, just follow your heart, bro. You'll be sweet. You know, I have a dream. I have this goal, guys. Yeah, follow your heart. You'll be sweet. You see, the Bible says that the heart is wicked above all things. Why would you ever want to follow a heart that is so easily swayed by, by this and that? You know, one day you want this, the next day you want that. But yeah, you just keep following your heart. You'll be right. See, let me tell you something. Follow, following your heart will only lead you to a painful and miserable life, and I've experienced it. You see, church, what we need to do is follow our spirit. You know, we've got to make sure that the Holy Spirit downloads into us what, you know, what heaven is saying. And so when our spirit gets full, then the spirit will fill our hearts. I mean, and then we can follow our heart because our, our heart is being influenced by heaven. Amen? And that's the problem when we want to follow our heart, but our heart will only lead us down to a path of destruction and regret every single time. And that's what I learned and, and experienced when I chose to follow my own heart and my own path, which leads me to my story, my testimony, which I want to share with you guys this morning. So, so growing up, I was brought up in a Christian home. Um, we would attend an Assembly of God church in the north side of Brisbane. And I remember as a kid, mum and dad would always drag us to church every Sunday. Um, as being a Polynesian kid, um, it's in our culture that you have, you, you're just born into the church. You know, you, you, got, you got no say. You, everyone goes to church. If you're Samoan, Tongan, Fijian, you're just brought up in the church. And so that was, that was us as kids. And so every Sunday for me was like, oh man, church again, here we go. And so... Um, that was me all throughout my teenage years. You know, I would go to youth groups. But for me, it was just hanging out with friends. Um, I've pretty, I think I gave my life about 50 times to the Lord. <laughs> but um, yeah, there was no uh, substance to my faith. You know, I knew who Jesus was. I knew he died on the cross for my sins. But that was it. That was it to my faith. And um, that was my faith journey all throughout my schooling, my teenage years. And so after grade 12... I had the um, opportunity to move down to Melbourne to play rugby league for, for the Melbourne Storm. Um, and so after grade 12, I packed my bags and off I went. And this was the first time I was uh, about to leave home. You know, this was the first time I was under the guidance of my parents. And so you could say I was pretty much, uh, I had free reign to my life. You know what I mean? Um, and so I get to Melbourne and... Um, you know, I'm training with these guys that I was just watching on TV. You know, I'm training with Billy Slater and uh, Cooper Cronk and Cameron Smith. And, and I was just in awe of the environment I was in, right? And I was just like, this is, this is awesome. You know, I was like a little kid. And so I was one of the young guys in the, in the, in the squad. And um, I ended up, you know, playing for the Melbourne Storm. But um, with that came... Um, a lot of things that I never thought I'd do, like personally with like in terms of alcohol and um, 
partying and, and you know, in being in that environment, you know, we were, got, I got to experience you know, meeting like celebrities and being invited to these in events, um, meeting people in higher places and, and I was just all new to me being a young kid. And so I was in that environment and I got to play footy down there. It was an awesome time, awesome, awesome experience. Um, and then when that came to an end, I moved to the Gold Coast. I played for the Gold Coast Titans. Um, and that's where my life kind of shifted and started to, I, looking back, I really started to experience things like drugs um, came into my life. And things that I never thought I'd, I'd do as a young kid. And it, it came with the culture of, of footy and, and, and alcohol. And um, so Gold Coast, I spent a couple of years over there. And then after that, I moved to Sydney. And that's where my whole life turned around. <laughs> Whoever lives in Sydney, man. Oh, good. I didn't love Sydney, to be honest. It really uh, had some bad memories down there. But when I moved to Sydney, to, uh, I had a contract with the Sydney Roosters. And as I got there, I, my first few weeks, I, got, I had a shoulder uh, uh, reconstruction on my shoulder. So I was out for a bit. But I came back to play, but then I got a hamstring problem. I tore my hamstring off the bone. And so it was like I had another eight weeks off. And it was then I started feeling all, I started just feeling down on myself. And I was like, this is, is this it? Like, I can't, I can't even play anymore. Um, and I started uh, feeling all these feelings of, of depression. Maybe I was feeling down on myself. And I resorted to alcohol and drugs, um, the party life. You know, I wasn't even focused on training anymore. I was just pretty much over it. And one, this is the day that changed everything when I came back to, to play and I was meant to debut and I was meant to play against uh, a Penrith Panthers. And this is the ba how bad the state I was in. I, was, I, was, I rocked up to training drunk. And this is, was the, game, the day before the game. I was meant to uh, do the team run. And looking back, I didn't, you know, I didn't care. I didn't really care what was happening. My life was upside down. And I walked in, walked the players will ask me, are you all right? Smithy, are you all right? Are you all right? What's going on? And I walked straight to the coach's office and I said, I'm done. Uh, I, I, I quit. I pretty much quit that day and um, returned back home to Brizzy. Uh, I just gave it up. And the next day I packed my bags and flew back to Brisbane to my, uh, stayed with my parents and I felt I just needed to get away from everything, get away from the Sydney life getting away from all these influences that, that were happening in my life. And so I flew back to Brizzy and I settled down and I started just getting a normal nine to five job. And uh, I started just playing footy with my mates, you know, just enjoying my footy again um, out in Ipswich with, with some of the boys out there. And it was there I got an opportunity to, to go work in the mines. And so I had an opportunity to go work in the mines for a friend. And so... While I was up in the mines, I was working away and I was two years into working in the mines and I started getting these, these thoughts in my head. You know, what is the meaning of life? You know, I'm working these long 12-hour shifts, seven, six days a week. I'm making good money. You know, I was doing a four week off, one, four weeks on, one week off and on our week off, we'd fly to Bali, we'd fly to um, somewhere with the boys and, you know, we were having a good time. You know, life was good. I was comfortable. But I was thinking, you know, what is the meaning of life? You know, I'm, I'm working hard. I'm paying these bills. Is this what I'm meant to do? Just work, pay the bills and die? And I was like, there's got to be more to life than this. And so one night I was, um, we were at the pub after work. And that's, that's what we did every Saturday after work. Everyone would just meet at this particular place and they'll have a few drinks. And so we all met there and I get there. And this night I didn't, I, I didn't choose to drink because I just felt a bit... I don't know, I just felt I didn't want to that night. And, and so I'm in the pub with everyone and I'm scanning the room and I'm looking around and everyone's having a good laugh. Everyone's having a beer, having fun. And I'm just looking, and I'm, in my heart, I was just shaking my head going, I'm sick of this. I'm done with this life. Like, is this what life, is this what life has come to? Just getting drunk on a Saturday night and then doing this whole thing again, road routine again until I die. I said, there's got to be more to life. This, I was saying, I didn't say it to anyone, but I just kept saying it in my heart. And so that, later that night, I just walked home. I just didn't say, 
said, didn't say bye to anyone. I just left. I was just, I'd left in the, like, uh, I was just annoyed. Uh, I was just annoyed. And I started, well, I remember walking home. And when I got home, I pretty much just jumped on my bed. And I looked, I looked to the ceiling and I said, God, if you're real, show me what the meaning of life is. And at this point, I wasn't even looking for God. Or God was far away from me. Never even, didn't even think of him throughout my, all those years. And that's all I said. I said, God, if you're real, show me what the meaning of life. But I said it in such a, a way that I was longing for an answer. I was like, please, someone tell me what the meaning of life is. Anyways, the next day, the next day I woke up and I, I felt something very different in me. You know, I felt like, um, first of all, I felt like a joy. There was a joy like bubbling up. I felt happy. And I thought, to myself, no, I didn't, I didn't take any drugs last night. I know that. No, I didn't drink. You know, I'm just being honest with you guys. But I, I know I didn't do any of, the, any of that. And I felt so joy. And I felt different. And I, and I felt someone, I, I, felt, I, did, I felt like I wasn't alone anymore. I felt like someone was holding me. And I felt this for, throughout the whole week. So I went to work on that Monday and I felt the same thing. And I was like, normally I'll drag my feet to work, you know, working a 12-hour shift. I'll be like, oh, here we go again. But this time I felt so joyful. And I couldn't explain it. I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't ask the boys what was going on. And so I left it and it just kept going for the whole week, every morning. And I said to myself, you know what? It's got to be. It's got to be something I said that night, you know, maybe God is trying to speak to me, you know, because that's all I could come up with. And so I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to just try this Christian thing out. Uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know why I'm feeling like this, but I'm just going to try this Christian thing out. So I went to a local church um, in Gladstone. That's where, that's where I was working. And they had this little pop-up shop in the, in the church there. And uh, I went in and I just brought me a Bible. I got me a, just a, uh, just a, New Testament Bible, and I started reading the Bible. And I, I, I remember getting in the car, just opened it up, and I read, I started from Matthew, and I read the words of, of Jesus, and straight away the, 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 the Bible just came to life. And I was so drawn to the Word like never before. And I've never read a book in my life. Uh, the only book I remember reading was Goosebumps in primary school. And if you, that's the only book I remember reading. But, uh, so I've never read and so I opened the, the Bible up and I'm reading the book and these, these stories were coming to life, you know. The, and I was thinking to myself, you know, well, gee, this Jesus guy, he's actually, he's the man, you know. And like he's setting people free. He's like, he's healing people. And I thought to myself, this guy is awesome. And so I read the Bible. I went from Matthew all the way to Revelation. Then I went to uh, Genesis, read the whole Bible. I pretty much read it in, in two weeks, just read the whole thing. I couldn't, couldn't get enough of it. And, and I, was, I remember I was in, um, on my smoko breaks and I was reading, I was downloading the Bible app and I was just reading and reading and the boys thought I was, I thought I'd seen a ghost because I, I wouldn't speak to them for the whole day and I was just reading the Bible and the, the Bible was just coming to life like never before. And so this one night I was, I was reading the Bible, I was reading the Word in my room and I came across John 10, 27. And it says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and no man shall snatch them out of my hand and now I will give them eternal life. And as soon as I read those words, um, I don't know if, if you've ever been to a 3D movie, it was like the words just popped out of the Bible and I had to literally step back and I said, what is going on? And I was like, oh, the words were just flying out and that very moment, I felt God squeeze my heart. It's like my heart stopped. God squeezed my heart and say, son, th that's the meaning of life. I heard a whisper. It's like, son, that's the meaning of life. To know me, to follow me, and I will give you eternal life. And, and I stopped and I, I cried like a baby. I, I fell to the ground and I wept and I just cried. And I knew it and I said to myself, this Bible is real. I, I yelled out, to, I, I just yelled out and said, I finally believe, I finally believe this is, this Bible is so real. I, and, I, and that moment changed my whole, whole life. That's the moment I surrendered my whole life to God. And I started going back to church. I started, I st and I got baptized in Gladstone. Um, things were, I noticed things were just falling out of my life, you know, um, the way I was speaking. You know, I remember I was, uh, I was smoking for four years before that, four years straight. 
and never touched a, a cigarette after that. And I later found out it was the Holy Spirit that was just refining my life, stripping away things that, that, he, I, that I didn't need in my life anymore. And I, and I went to work and I was, and I was telling the boys, I was telling the boys what had happened. And they thought I was a freak. They thought, they thought you're crazy. Like, what's going on? You know, they, they just thought I was a whole new person. And the thing was, I, I had four more years on my contract on, in Gladstone. And I asked God, you know, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? My life is yours. And he said, go back, to home, back, go back home to Brisbane and tell your family what I've done to you. And I heard that really clearly. Go back home and tell your family that what I have done. And so I, I finished work. I got a transfer to Brisbane. Um, and so at this point, I didn't tell my parents. I didn't. No one knew what I was doing in Gladstone. They knew I wasn't working in Gladstone, but they didn't know what happened in Gladstone. So I was pretty much like the the black sheep of the family. I always just ring up everyone. Hey, he's going, going good. Yeah, all good. You need any money? No, nah, all good. And then um, that's all they would hear from me. I was like, yep, Smitty's all right. He'll be right. But this time I came back home to my parents' house and mum opened the door and she looked at me and she stepped back and it was like she saw a ghost. And she goes, son, something's happened to you. And he goes, yeah. I go, I found God, mum. And she just dropped and she just cried and she said, son, you know, mum and dad, dad and I have been praying for you all these years for you to come back to the Lord. And that moment, that very moment, I knew the, the power of prayer and how powerful prayer is. You know, it was like God finally reached, the prayers finally reached him and he was like, you know what? It's time to go get him. Let's go get Smithy. And I encourage anyone here this morning that is praying for, 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 for your sons, for your daughters, for your family, keep praying. Keep praying. God listens. God hears to every, everything that you are saying to Him. And it's not in our timing. It's all in His timing. We've got to trust His timing. And so that happened. Um, and so I started, I, attended, I started going to a church in Brizzy. Um, I started getting into, I joined the worship team. And I thought to myself, you know, I'd never even think about singing in a church you know, the only singing I was doing was in a garage four in the morning singing Backstreet Boys with, with the boys, you know, doing kick-ons with the boys. And that was my life. But, you know, who knows, you know, you, you know that God uses the foolish things of this world, you know, for his glory. And he used me to, to, to worship. And, and it's there where I met my wife, Jade, who's back there with our two boys. And um, he's blessed me with her and our two little sons and, you know, all these things that God starts putting in your life when you, when, you, when you come to him. You know, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added to you. What I've learned is that you know, all these other things, they're not, they're not cars or houses or these things that we desire. No, they're kingdom, they're kingdom things. And so all these things were like, um, I started going on mission trips. Um, I went to Cambodia, to China to Egypt and things I would never even thought in my life that I was doing. But when you surrender and hand your life to him, he will show you, he will direct your path like he says he, he does in his word. And it says, seek first. Notice how it says seek first. It doesn't say seek second. You got to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. And so all that happened and looking back on my life, you know, I, you see, I don't know where I'd be if I continue to follow my own path and, and my own way. You know, there's a proverb that says there's a, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. You know, there was a way that I thought it was right to live the way I was living, but it was leading me down to, to the pits. You know, Matthew seven fourteen says, um, for the gate is narrow. And the way is hard. This is Jesus talking. He says, the way is hard. It's going to be hard. That leads to life. But those who choose it are very few. You see, very few of us are going to choose that narrow path that leads to life. Because the, the verse right after it says, but broad is the way. And wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many choose it. Because it's the easy way. Anyone can live that way. 
And that's the way I was living. And, you know, looking back, at, there, were, there were times when, you know, I felt like giving up. Even though I experienced that moment with God, I felt like, this is not easy, God. And it, we just need Him every day of our lives. You know, I'm not the perfect Christian. No one is. But we serve a perfect God. Amen. And so, you know, I've lost friends, you know, friends I, that I thought I would have forever. But no, they think you're Jesus freak. But you know, I wouldn't change one thing. I wouldn't change one bit of where God has brought me to. And so church this morning for us, you know, we need to stop right now. And we need to, we need to listen to the story that, that Jesus is telling us here. You see that everything you've been working towards will probably let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. See, we need to stop waiting for that big event. It's not going to fix you. That big event is not going to fix you. It's not going to fix what's missing inside your soul. You know, when you're laying at bed at night saying, man, what's wrong with my life? See, what's wrong with our lives is that we keep trying to fill our barns with, with more and more stuff. But the more stuff you try to get, the less you actually feel good about yourself. That's why Tom Brady, a few years ago in this interview, so Tom Brady is, a, if you don't know who Tom Brady is, he's an American um, NFL player. And at the time of his, this interview, he's, he'd already won like uh, four, four uh, Super Bowls. And so this guy, he's probably one of the top five known, most famous athletes in the world right now. And so he's a good looking guy, right? He's, he's, he's an MVP of the league. He's an MVP of the Super Bowl. He's in commercials, he's in movies, and, and at the time of this um, interview, I think his contract was worth $180 million or something like that, and his wife was a, 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 is a um, Victoria's Secret model who probably earns twice as much as him. And so you get this, in this interview, in this 60-minute interview, and you, can, and you can watch it for yourself on YouTube, he sits down and he gets all quiet after hearing all his accomplishments read out to him, and he goes, yeah... And the last time I won one, I thought to myself, you know, after all this stuff you've, you've just said, there's got to be more to life. You know, that's interesting, yeah? That's interesting. You see, this guy has it all. From the outside looking at his life, you know, he, he has everything the world has to offer him. Top of his game, and he in his own heart recognizes something, that there's something missing in his life. We know what it is. It's Jesus. And he's, he's asking himself, you know, why am I not satisfied? You see, the only one who can satisfy the human heart is the one who created it. Amen? And so church, I want to encourage you this morning, maybe just say, save some of you some heartache. For those of you that are so in deeply pursuit of that one thing, I don't know what that one thing is, but you do. It could be a, a dream that you might have. That car could be meeting that right person. Could be that degree that you've always wanted. You see, I want to tell you something this morning, that there is absolutely no feeling in this life that will bring you true fulfillment. There is no achievement in this life that will bring you true fulfillment. There is no ceremony in this life that will bring you true fulfillment. There is no experience, there is no degree that will bring you true fulfillment. But there is a single person that will bring you true fulfillment. And his name is Jesus. Amen. You see, the only big event that will guarantee to change your life, you know, is the second you realize that you cannot live another instant without letting the love of Jesus be your everything. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians about true contentment is only found in Christ. And if the team want to come up, he tells us in Philippians 4, 11, and 12, Paul says this, Not that I was ever in need, for I have, I have learned how to, con to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. You know, don't get me wrong, church. There's nothing wrong with dreaming big or or studying to get that degree, or wanting to find that right person in your life, or desiring to, to buy that house one day, or that car that you really want. There's nothing wrong with those things. 
but it is wrong to think that you'll find true happiness in them. Amen. You see, if God chooses to give you material possessions, it's because of his good pleasure to us. But if you make those possessions the love of your life, you're being deceived about true contentment. And so we need to stop and listen to what Jesus is telling us in this parable. That what our lives would look like if we were raw and and real and honest with ourselves, right? That we're just pretty much building a barn. And our goal is to, to tear down that barn and build a bigger one. And our goal is to get that barn as full as we can and retire and do whatever we want to do. See, we have to admit that that plan stinks. That instead of worrying about the size of the barn, we just have to say, God, thank you for this barn that you have given me. You gave it to me and Jesus, you were the center of my life. If this barn grows, Jesus, you are the center of my life. If this barn stays the same, Jesus, you are the center of my life. If this the barn gets a little smaller, the Jesus, you are the center of my life. Because I'm happy with who I am and I'm happy who you've called me to be. And I'm going to put Jesus in the middle of everything that I do. Amen? And that's the big event. Church, that is the big event. The big event is, that that is, the, is the moment of your life where you have a revelation that you just can't go on living this way, chasing after that one thing. When you realize that, church, why don't you stand with me this morning? Church, this morning, I just want to, I just want to encourage you and I want to, just want to give some people hope in this place this morning. Where maybe you've given up on yourself, you, you think you're disqualified from the goodness and, and grace of God. You know, you got tattoos, good. You got scars, good. You got battle stories, good. That's the stuff God can use. And you see, I'm a living testimony of, what, of how God can use a, someone who was broken, without hope and, and in a very dark place. And you see, we're all messed up. Each and every one of us. We're all broken. We've all made some terrible decisions. And that's why we come into this place, because we all need hope. Amen? You see, Jesus isn't drawn to our perfection. He's drawn to our brokenness. And so Jesus this morning invites you. He invites you this morning to come as you are, and I will give you rest for your souls. And so, no, so why not make that decision this morning? That this morning is my big event to make Jesus the center of everything in my life. That this is the only big event to guarantee to change your life. Make that big event be your moment this morning. And realize this, church. Realize this, that if I have everything except Jesus, I have nothing. But if I have nothing but Jesus, I've got everything. Amen. Church, let me pray for us this morning. <sighs> Father, we thank you this morning that you, you deal with us in grace. That despite all the things in our lives that we place before you, we thank you that you are always quick to forgive and always leading us and guiding us back to that narrow path that leads to life. Just like you say in your word, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. So Father, this morning we ask that you just bring each of us to that place of Christ alone contentment and weed out everything that we are looking to other than Jesus and that we would truly find the fullness of joy and give you all the glory that you deserve, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Church. The